All right. Welcome to Art Appreciation. We are on week, I don't know, I don't even know what day it is, April 18th. Holy cow, how did that happen? All right, we're talking about Judy Glantzman and Francisco Goya today. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about these artists. Let me mute anybody. If you're just coming in, just feel free to try to mute yourself. There is a button somewhere for you. Um, yeah, all right. So let's get started. First, we're gonna talk about Goya. Uh, one of my favorite artists, Francisco Goya was born on March 30th. So he just had a birthday, except for it was 1746 in Fuentes de Todos, Spain. And he died April 16th, 1828 in Bordeaux, France. Um, he was born uh, to a lower middle class family and he was the fourth of six children. And he spent most of his childhood in Zaragoza. Um, we don't know too much about his childhood. The best, um, most, uh, the best information that we have was some letter exchanges that he had with his oldest friend. At, uh, in 19, or, sorry, 1770, he went to Italy and that is when his career really began. And then at, at some point he went back to uh, Saragossa and he studies under Francisco Bayou. Um, and he married Bayou's sister, Joseph Josepa, who uh, he had several children with, although only one man, shame, shame. And the man, the oldest son, uh, only survived into adulthood. So Goya had some really hard things happen in his life. His son passed away, and then uh, he, he fell into a really terrible depression at that point. Um, he basically said he stopped living for that whole period. Um, then in 1774, he was commissioned to pr produce a series of cartoons for the Royal Tapestries. And those tapestries, uh, that factory is still running today. You can go see that factory. And in fact, there's sort of a Goya pilgrimage at this point that you can go to all the different places in Spain uh, and Italy along the places where he lived, his family lived the tapestries place, and uh, I have a student who just told me they're going to go do this entire trip uh, about Goya. Um, so we're talking paintings, tapestries, and then printmaking as well. So he became a printmaker, uh, and his prints are very political. There's a lot of satire. There's a lot of um, political humor going on in those. Uh, would have been interesting to compare those to Daumier's cartoons. That could be an interesting comparison. Um, but I didn't do that. I chose to compare, uh, a compare Goya to Judy Glanson, which I'll get to in just a moment. So he's going along, he, along, he's having this great career, and then all of a sudden he gets really, really sick and uh, an undiagnosed uh, illness, which causes him to go deaf. Um, and that was another strike, sort of a big blow to him, and he goes into another depression. Um, he starts feeling, you know, very melancholy, and then he spends... Um, he makes 80 etchings at the time about the, the more satirical political times that are happening. And then in, in 1814, he really gets depressed and he use, this is where you start seeing and people start saying that he's going crazy. Um, but I, I don't, I wouldn't say that, um, but that's what people say and that is what you will hear and you can decide for yourself. But this is some theories that people have is in his later years, he goes sort of into seclusion because he's so embarrassed about his deafness and he lives out the rest of his life in um, the house of the deaf man. Um, he, he does 14 black paintings um, and they were painted directly onto the plaster walls in the home. Um, then he uh, has to escape to Bordeaux and he spends the rest of his life in exile in France with his maid and companion, uh, Locadia Weiss. His wife, Josefa, died in 1812. So um, that is his life, pretty wild life that he had with, um, you know, a lot of political times, excuse me, an itchy nose. 
tis springtime and um, deafness, uh, but overall, if you look at his work, there's a huge wide spectrum. If you Google him from prints, tapestries, and paintings, some of them are a lot more lighthearted. Some of them are very intensely sad and um, the theme for today I would call is sort of the art of the grotesque, that teetering line of uh, ugly and beautiful at the same time. And Judy Glantzman is another person who does that. Judy Glantzman was, uh, is living and working in New York City. She was born in 1956 in Long Island and she graduated from RISD and she also teaches there now. She um, shows her work at Betty Cunningham Gallery, along with a lot of other artists that I've mentioned to you that we've talked about, like Graham Nixon, um, and uh, who's the one from last week? Stanley Lewis, or two weeks ago, excuse me. And uh, she is, she was my teacher. Somebody's sound is on, so if you could mute yourself. Either, okay, Daniel or Marina, I'm muting you guys. Um, I think everyone's muted now. Okay, so Judy was my teacher at the New York Studio School of Drawing, Painting, and Sculpture. Let me just scroll down to her. So I've put in a few of my favorite paintings here of Goya, and I've added in some, some works of art. And then if you scroll down to Judy, but you also have the handout in front of you printed out, hopefully, so Judy Glansman was my teacher. And in fact, a lot of the uh, lessons that I teach you in class come from Judy. A lot of the paper folding, adding paper, um, really creative kind of stuff. One of my favorite things about her class is that she would always make really crazy elaborate setups for us to draw. And that's where I started, you know, when I come in and bring all these funny things to paint and draw, it was because she would always um, have the model doing something wild, like at the top of a 10 foot ladder and holding a skull and, um, sculptural birds everywhere and just color and really exciting things. So she was, she was the, a teacher who really pushed us to really use our creative energy and pull from our subconscious and pull from that space in our brain that we don't really know as much about, but we trust it when we become painters and you sort of click into that part of your brain. That's, that's where Judy really thrives, in my opinion. Her work is very illustrative. It's also painterly. She does it all uh, mostly on paper. She makes a lot of sculptures. She makes sculptures about, um, her sculptures are birds, a lot of hands. She loves hands, always painting hands. She will um, take a folded up, giant folded up piece of paper and take it on the subway with her and keep it in her purse anywhere she goes and just unfold a blank part of the page and draw someone's hand or their face on the subway and then go home and paint one of her sculptures and then go somewhere else. And then it, it sort of has this uh, pieced together quality to it. So um, her work is very loose. It's very um, unique in my opinion. And, I, and she's someone who I feel breaks all the rules and still, uh, you know, succeeds in the art world, even though she's breaking on the, all the rules. You, you can, her show at Betty Cunningham uh, a couple, last year or the year before. Anyway, they were all those crumpled pieces of paper that were unfolded and you could see all the folds in the paper and you could see her process and the way that she works. And um, if you ever get a chance, uh, look her up if you're going to New York and see where she might be showing her work. But you can see also that she has shows all over the country, um, all over the world, and currently teaches at RISD. I don't know if she does any fun summer classes. Sometimes she does Chautauqua. So you could check in on that if you want to take one of her classes. But this is someone who brings a lot of energy to the table. Um, she talks fast and she's always, you know, very vibrant and you can see that in the videos below. Uh, but what she did is she really, uh, one of her shows was actually a, a tribute to some of Goya's work. So you can see that she has used his paintings as inspiration for her paintings as a jumping off point. 
Um, this is Judy in her studio uh, several years ago. She looks exactly the same. She doesn't age. And here's a, another little video of her and you can see her working in her process and how she sort of turned the art of scribbling and sketching into her art in some ways and not afraid to just draw right on top of another drawing, not afraid to just cut paper and glue it together. She does a lot of collage. She puts actual sculptures into her paintings. You can see right here, there's a little uh, sculpture of a head. She will make a bunch of little clay heads, clay birds, clay hands. Um, her her um, home is in Greenwich Village, her apartment, and uh, that's also her studio. So I got to go there one time and uh, take some pictures of her in her studio, which I'll try to post a few of them on here of her studio. Um, it's just that I have like 20,000 photos now. I was trying to find a picture the other day and goodness gracious, I gave up. Here is an example of some of her hand sculptures. I really love her hand sculptures. Um, no, I realized I forgot to pull up the actual PowerPoint. Don't give me a second here. You can see how organized I am <laughs> or lack thereof. Okay. Let's get our PowerPoint right here. So two very exciting artists, in my opinion. <clears throat> well, I guess we'll just expand out this way and show it like this. So this first image here is uh, a painting by Goya on the left and a painting by Judy on the right, possibly inspired by uh, this Goya painting. You can see very much the difference in the application of paint, but the um, the thing about Goya's work, and I feel like he has so many different qualities to his painting. He can do something as realistic as this, and then he does cartoon figures that are much less realistic looking, but if you look at his lace, his application of paint on the lace, you can see he might have been looking at Velasquez, um, but the Spanish painters really knew how to paint lace, and that's probably because they wore a lot of lace and they had to learn. This, this painting in particular really looks like Adele to me, but um, it is a patron. It is uh, probably the woman who bought the painting or the family member who bought the painting, a commissioned work of art. So he made a living with commissions of portraits by doing the prints and the tapestries uh, for, for patrons. Um, so this one is another one. You can see that this woman here was a woman of high standing. You can tell because she's got the lace, she's wearing fur and she's wearing red. And red was notably a color of uh, higher up uh, power of status or of royalty sometimes or purple. So whenever you see purple and red robes, it's usually signifying that it's someone of status or of religious uh, status. And then over here we have Judy Glantzman's interpretation of a similar painting. You can see she's done this face over and over and over again and interlaced with um, an actor. Um, you'll probably know his name, I can't remember. Uh, feel free to type it in if you want to. Uh, I was just watching the video from the last uh, time that I did this and someone uh, called out the name of the artist uh, or of the actor in this painting. So, um, oh, here it is. Let's see what we got. Peter Falk, both of, from Taria and Suzanne. So that must be the correct answer. I don't know. Okay. Oh, here's another one. Let's see. Colombo. Oh, okay. It's Colombo. All right, moving on to our next images. Um, I believe this one on the left by Judy has to do with uh, the life and times of the HIV crisis in the 90s. And um, I could be wrong about that. I don't know. I feel like I've heard that in, in one of the videos. But either way, Judy is always dealing with uh, sort of the political times of what's going on in the real life. She's interested in the feeling of what's going on underneath the skin. She's almost portraying the spirit of these people rather than the actual person. 
um, you can see that she the, these are this is made up of several panels and several different standing figures. It goes from floor to ceiling, so they're larger than life figures and these are sometimes subjects that people these are hard subjects to deal with so um, we're talking about things happening in time in in the political times that um, really for both of them they're feeling a pull towards these political times and what's going on and they're wanting to bring that to the surface bring that to the light it is our job as artists to sort of talk about the things that shouldn't be talked about it is our job to bring these things to the surface and um, I think that's what both of these artists are doing. So uh, with Goya, one of the things that I really, he has several paintings or etchings about people who are floating, flying, they're riding gliders, they're in hot air balloons or they're um, being thrown up. Uh, I actually made a painting that uh, is a, a sort of a, it's from and inspired by one of the Goya paintings. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know if I have that painting in this PowerPoint, but I don't think I do. But I'll try and post it on the comment section for you. So this is uh, Judy's version of Saturn, and this is Goya's version of Saturn. And um, as you can see, they're a little grotesque. They're a little bit uh, intense and in your face kind of work. They, these, these people are not playing around. They're, they're going to give you the good, bad, and ugly. They're going to give you the rawness. They're going to give you what's really going on in the world. And so this is um, their versions of these things. You can see that Judy's got a uh, painting, drawing, collage, and sculpture in this piece. Um, and it's almost as if the, the face has turned multiple times. And now, actually, now that I see this piece, there was a figure drawing day that we had in her class where she had us, um, the model faced forward, we drew the model facing forward, then the model turned, and we did the drawing right on top of the other head, and then this way, right on top of the other head, and rotated all the way around. And that's what it looks like she's doing here. Um, <clears throat> she's really fun to have as a teacher because she always says, you know, I come up with these ideas and then you guys inspire me and we're all, you know, we're all playing off of each other here. And so it's a really fun interactive class. Another thing that she does in class that I really like is she invited us all to put our paintings up behind the model so that there were paintings within the paintings that were referencing the paintings that we were doing were also the artists and so on and so on. So layers and layers of interlaying narrative and uh, importance throughout these pieces. Um, here's another painting by Goya on the right here. And this is, uh, if you look closely, you can see that there, this, this at first looks like maybe a nice painting. There's an animal, there's, people surrounding him, but then you look and see that the children are starving in the painting. And uh, there's a woman reaching up to give this starving child to the man. Um, oh, I don't, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, there's, uh, <clears throat> hold on one second. Let me just fix this. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so you can see that uh, this baby is being handed over to this creature. Maybe it's a creature of death. Maybe it's, I'm not sure, I don't know all the, the parts about this painting, but you can see there's, a, there's hanging little, maybe children or dolls back there. But overall, there's a dead child here. There is a starving child here. And then there's a, maybe a little more meat on his bones over here. So you can see that um, Goya is dealing with the political times and he's dealing with uh, the what's going on. There's starving. There's trouble happening in town in in Bar or in Spain at the time. And he's really trying to deal with those 
political issues. And this is Judy Glassman version of the same creature that is here, is also here. You can tell by the horns there. And she's gone about it in a completely different way. But this is about, again, you know, d death and life. And she's got a gun in here. She's got um, all these children's heads, the same as over here. There's a bunch of these three babies. There's these three babies here. Um, there are sculptural heads. There are collaged heads. There are um, painterly qualities. So you can see that she's referencing this painting and she's also gone about it in a completely different way. So just because you're looking at another artist for inspiration doesn't mean it's going to look exactly like that artist's work. In fact, some, I look at a lot of art history and then I close the book and I go make my painting and I hope that it, you know, Goya sort of gets in my brain and comes out subconsciously, but it's still you're never going to copy Goya, so don't worry about copying Goya. You can use him as inspiration as much as you want. Well, one thing they both do in, uh, in their work is often show a whole lot of figures or heads. Um, again, this is another iteration of this figure with the, the ram's head, or, and then we have all of these women and children here who are hungry, and they look scared, and they look worried, and you can tell by the color the mood that is being created here. This piece by Judy, what you can see, it's just probably a hundred different heads all over the place. Um, these heads are overlapping. Judy's not afraid to use whatever medium she needs to get these paintings uh, to tell the message that she wants them to have, to have the, the feeling of rawness and this sort of crudeness almost and the good, bad, the ugly. It's almost the spirit of the person or the people or the mood of the painting comes through more than you actually see individual things. And then I, I realize this is hard to see and this piece of paper is probably about 10 foot by 10 foot large and it may be, you can actually see all the folds in the paper here. Um, and she, uh, she was uh, carrying around large pieces of paper folded up in her purse when I met her and drawing them all over the subway and anywhere that she found things to look at and draw. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is um, one of the political etchings on uh, lithographs at, uh, that is, uh, there is one available to see right now at the San Diego Museum of Art. It's one of the more famous donkey uh, lithograph, so I hope you get a chance to go look at those. It's a satirical show of uh, lithographs, and there's Picasso's, there's Lichtenstein, there's Goya, there's, it's a great, it's a great little room of lithographs. I really enjoy it. Um, and this is one of Judy's little drawings, also inspired by a Goya character. So you can see how you can be inspired by an artist, uh, learn from an artist, pull from them, and then create your own work. This piece here is a self-portrait by Goya. So you can see, again, he's got looseness, he's got cartoon style, he's got real realism. He's got, obviously, he's able to do whatever he wants with the paintbrush. He can manipulate anything with the paintbrush. And so um, my goal is always to get myself to the point that anything that I think about in here that I want to paint, I can actually get it onto the paper and have it look like that. And I think he has definitely gotten to that level. So that's why I always say everything is practice. You know, it's always to get us to that point so that when we do have that inspiration strike in our head, then we're able to actually put it down on the paper and have it look the way we have it look up here. Uh, Judy, um, again, uh, look, I love this one. There's heads everywhere. Her dre this dress is uh, stripes, but these are all little heads. If you look, there's heads everywhere um, and hands everywhere. And it's sort of like a ghost-like image. Um, it's very loose and open and translucent. And um, <clears throat> I think there's a lot to learn from someone like Judy because she uh, breaks all the rules. And um, I'm always telling you, yeah, you know, prove me wrong, break the rules, put the horizon in the middle, uh, draw on crumpled paper and hang it in a gallery, um, show your process. And I think Judy's work is a lot about the process rather than the end result, but obviously the end result's pretty fascinating as well. Um, here's another one of the lithographs by Goya. Uh, this is uh, on the gorier side. You can see this is a dismembered person here. There was a lot of war um, and hunger and awful things going on 
during the political time in Spain at the time. So he is, um, as an artist, he's bringing that to the forefront and not letting us forget these things. And that's what we have to do as artists. Um, here's another one of Judy's multiple figure pieces. Um, again, you can see she loves heads, hands, and feet. And they, the work also reminds me a little bit of June Leaf who we talked about a few weeks ago, this sort of loose, loose drawing quality that comes to play here. Um, this is one of my favorite ones, all of the flying images. I really love these images, with the wings, and um, it reminds me of the glider port that we sometimes go to in landscape painting class. Um, so as you can see, I'm always trying to get you to just keep drawing, keep drawing, keep drawing. Don't, you don't have to erase as much. You can just add on to it and sort of build the drawing that way. This is a really good example of that, what Judy's doing here. She's probably drawn that face, I don't know, 10, 15 times, maybe in different colors. Um, but you get the feeling that there's like a living, breathing thing going on there. Um, <clears throat> Here's another one of the gargoyles, and he's getting a little toenail clipping here. So some of them are funny and humorous, and um, they're more uh, on the lighter side, and others are much heavier. Um, the last piece I have is um, the most famous etching by Goya, and uh, it's about his dreams and his night. It's about his nightmares, and then um, this is one of my favorite. Judy Glantzman's of all these hands that she's drawn of people and you can see how she's folded it into I don't know maybe 30 different folds here and you can see all of the wrinkles and all of the process that she's showing and all these little scribbles that she's doing so scribbling is art and um I think uh, she's someone to really learn. Both of these artists are people to look at and learn from in order when you're feeling afraid to paint something you know you need to paint or there's a story you want to tell but you're afraid to talk about it or afraid to paint it. Uh, these are the people to look at because these are a couple of fearless artists if you ask me. Um, so whether you think Goya went a little crazy or not, um, I don't know. To me, you, you have to separate the artist from the art sometimes. There's a lot of artists who did a lot of terrible things, but they're really great artists. So however you feel about that, um, I hope you enjoyed Goya and Judy Glantzman. And if you get a chance, there are some videos on the website of Judy um, in her studio. So you can really hear her and see her process. And uh, now I will open it up to any questions or comments that anybody has. So feel free to mute yourself or type in the comment box or let me know what you liked or didn't like. Come on. <laughs> Somebody, unmute yourself. I have a question, uh, yes. Katie. Uh, does your teacher ever paint like finished work or is always looking like a bunch of sketches? Um, I mean, I would consider this a finished work. This is a painting on canvas, I believe, or maybe mm -hmm. it's on paper. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But um, uh, I, her style, these, these were all pulled from last year and her style has changed, but they really are. I mean, I feel like this is a very finished painterly piece even though it's collage, but I think she really likes the element of drawing with painting. And I think she likes the ha to have the process showing in the work too. So um, I don't know currently what her work is looking like at the moment, but I would say these pieces are much more finished. But yeah, there's always a loose openness um, here. I mean, this one's very finished in my opinion. Um, and there, if you Google her, you'll see a lot of other, of other paintings that she did um, that may be more, you know, these are pretty finished. This is pretty finished. Um, and I guess it depends on what you consider finished, you know? I consider, I consider this, this finished. It's finished when it's finished to you, I guess is the point. Anyone else? Hi, Kate. Hi, Mar Hi, Marina. Kate. This is Marina. I just noticed that, that uh, Goya died in France. Uh, how yes. did he get to France in the, uh, at the end of his life? He was exiled to France. Oh. So it says, um, 
He moved to a farmhouse on the outsides of Madrid, and then he lived there until 1821, and he completed the black paintings, and then he moved to Bordeaux in 1824 to escape the oppressive autocratic regime of Ferdinand. I don't know my Roman numerals. What's VII? -I? Seven? Is that seven? Ferdinand the seventh? So he had, to, he had to escape. He was a refugee, basically. He had to spend his life in exile in France with his uh, maid, who, because his okay. wife passed away. So then he left to France with his maid and spent the rest of his life there um, and her daughter in 1828. So actually, several artists we've talked about recently have had to flee their country near the end of their lives uh, in order to... Uh, finish up their lives. So that's why he ended up in France because of the political regime. So this was a time of oppression. There was a time where people were not having enough food. There was a lot of political angst going on. And that's why his work also reflects that. All right, thanks everybody. Oh, it looks like I have one little comment here. Let me check my chat. Oh, seven, yes. Uh, so five is the V and then two I's make seven. All right. Thank you all, I hope you have a great day. I'm going to put this recording up, um, even though the other one from last year is still up too. So you can watch this one or the, I'll put this one up instead. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye.